Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympics and Paralympics, and we love history. And most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history, which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia all the way to now. And today we're highlighting the fifth Olympiad that was held in Stockholm, Sweden in 1912, which is the only time that Sweden has hosted the Olympic Games. Well, so far, at least. And it has been nicknamed the Swedish masterpiece because of how well run the games were. And also because finally we get to see the Olympic Games really hitting their stride as their own event that athletes want to participate in, spectators want to go to, and earning the Olympic Games its reputation as the pinnacle of athletic achievement. So, Sarah, before we get into this too much further, I have to ask, as usual, what did you know about the 1912 Games before (laughs) getting to this point? (laughs) Honestly, not a ton, which, you know, a lot of these early games, I feel like that's been the case. Um, Maybe I know of a few key players, and I know that we'll talk about them. I knew that these were the games Mm -hmm. where we hear about Jim Thorpe. Mm -hmm. Um, We, and this is also showing my very American view. One of my favorite trivia questions to bug people with is about a certain general who we'll talk about at some point in this episode, I know, um, (laughs) (laughs) who a lot of people didn't know was an Olympian. So not a ton um, other than just some of the key players that we hear about. Again, my very USA blinders are on. But yeah, I think that's really it. Um, I did know about one of the highlights we're going to talk about Um, with the gold medals, but Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what about you? Same as you. I really did not know much about these games. And I think it's one of those that because it was so well run and there was relatively little drama, that's kind of why, sadly, it gets overlooked because things Mm -hmm. (laughs) actually, for the most part, went the way that they were supposed to. And so I guess they're people feel like there's not as much to to gossip about <laughs> when it comes to these yeah. games. Uh, but like you, the main thing I knew these games for were Jim Thorpe. But yeah, it, for me, it was fun to get into these games a little bit more because there was so little that I knew about them. So everything really felt new and fresh to me. And before we get into the highlights, uh, this will actually be the last Olympiad that we talk about here in this first season. So while it won't be our last episode, uh, we will, like I said, have an athlete profile on Jim Thorpe coming up next. And then we'll have some uh, bonus episodes that we're going to roll out. Uh, this will be the last Olympiad that we talk about uh, until we take a little break. So on that note, I think we can go ahead and get into some of the highlights of these games. All right. So let's talk about these highlights. Um, So these were the first Olympics to feature art competitions with five categories that were inspired by sports, though these are no longer considered official Olympic events by the IOC. These were the first games to use automatic timing devices photo finishes, and also a public address system for the athletic events. These were the first Olympics with competitors officially from all five continents, with Japan making its first appearance and marking the first appearance by an Asian country. These were the last Olympic Games to issue solid gold medals. So if you didn't know that medals were not made of solid gold, I'm so sorry to break that news to you. (laughs) And the games were held between May 5th to July 27th, 1912. So it was a much more reasonable time frame than some of these other games that we've talked about. Yeah, definitely. So what on this list surprised you the most? I know that you and I both are going to be very partial to the inclusion of Japan, that that's really exciting. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Um, So knowing that 
these were the first games that had officially all five continents represented. I think that's really cool because the Olympic rings are supposed to be representative of the five main continents. Uh, um, right. Originally. So, and then also the, these were the first Olympics to see the automatic timing devices yeah. and the photo finishes that I thought that that wouldn't come until later. So I think it's awesome right. that we see them, but I just thought we were not there yet. What about yeah. you? No, that one probably surprised me the most too. I did not realize these were the first games and that frankly, that that technology existed back then. Now we'll get into this a little bit. It's clunkier than, uh, you know, what we see today from our mm -hmm. uh and this is not an ad but from our uh, olympic friends at omega you know <laughs> who who provide all the timing today <laughs> yeah. but um but yeah it was interesting for me to see that this was the first time and it makes sense because as more athletes start to participate we're going to have closer finishes and mm -hmm. that's going to lead to more controversy that's going to lead to more arguments of well i think this person crossed first i think this person did and also our Apologies for, you know, any Olympians or Paralympians who listen and you're suddenly finding out that your gold medal that you won maybe is not pure gold <laughs> like you thought it was. Um, you probably already knew that, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's it's about the accomplishment, not what it's made of at the end yes, of the day. <laughs> and to be clear that it's not just painted a gold color. There is gold right. in the medal, just yes. not solid gold. Right. Yes. So uh, definitely still has that golden touch to it. But we're going to take a quick little break and then we are going to come back and talk about the background of how the games ended up in Stockholm. So we'll see you in just a second. OK, Sarah, tell me what you know about Sweden. And I know I'm catching you completely <laughs> off guard with that question because <laughs> that's not in our notes. <laughs> well, I'm trying to not bring up Ikea, but I'm bringing up Ikea. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, y'all. <laughs> um, so I think about Swedish meatballs and I think about Ikea. Okay. And if yeah. anyone out there is a Friends fan, a friend's fan, I cannot mm -hmm. help but think about Phoebe Buffay pretending to be Swedish and referring to her name. I think she calls her name Ikea or something because she's trying to <laughs> not mm. to bullshit who she is. So anyway, yeah. I think about Ikea. Um, and so the colors <laughs> that come to mind are blue and gold. I do think yeah. about curling. You know, they've got a yeah. dynamic curling team over there. So, of course, in modern times, I think about the sports that they excel at now. But right. I hate to say it, but it's Ikea. That's what I think of first. And yeah, <laughs> I know that there's so I'm so sorry if you're Swedish and you're listening. I know that there's a lot more history. In fact, I will. I'm going to go read about that history tonight, probably, because this is what I do. I get curious and I'm just going to start reading about everyone. <laughs> From well, yeah, well, it, here's the deal. I really know next to nothing about Sweden as a country myself. Um, and I will admit one of the first things that comes to my mind, uh, sadly, is Swedish fish. The, the snack, because mm. because sometimes I like to get those when I go to the movies. Those um, are delicious. Yeah. And my wife hates them. So I know she won't try to take them away from me when we go see a <laughs> Just movie. Just like my so, husband hates them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, sometimes you have to do something for yourself. So, yeah, I, I wish I knew more about the country. Um, I know that it regularly gets ranked as one of the happiest countries in the world. Yes. Uh, which yeah. is a huge deal. I know that they have high taxes because that's something that gets talked about a lot here in the U.S. when we think about Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, people there seem very happy despite that fact. And the the Nobel Prizes originate oh, from Sweden yeah. and are given out by, yeah, are given out by a panel in Sweden. And, you know, the, the royal family attends that. So, so yeah, the Nobel Prizes, that's where they come from. So that's, that's the extent of my knowledge as well. Yeah. And I want to say I've met people from Sweden um, and okay. they've all been lovely. And if there you're you listening go. to this and you're one of those people, thank you for being so lovely and kind. <laughs> but, so yeah. I have nothing 
negative to say about Sweden. I'm just so yeah. sorry that we all think IKEA is really, really <laughs> fascinating. I, I'm <laughs> so. literally sitting on an IKEA stool at my IKEA desk right now. So hey, same. And again, this is not an ad for IKEA, but I mean, you know, if they want to sponsor us, like that's cool. So, um, but anyway, yeah, I, I just felt like we needed to admit up front that we are not experts on the country of Sweden before we get into the background of them getting the games. And yeah, there's some things we need to learn about the country, but the capital is Stockholm and we're talking about Stockholm and how they got the games in 1912. So here was something really interesting to me is that Stockholm was the only city to bid for 1912. So um, pretty easy selection process for the IOC this time around. But my question when I found that out was, well, wait a second, how did that happen? Especially when we saw more bidding happening for the 1908 games. And when those ended up going so well, you would think that after that success, more cities would have been clamoring to host. For starters, it really helped that there were two Swedes who were a part of the IOC at the time, uh, Victor Bach and Clarence von Rosen. So the two of them were very eager for Sweden to host the games uh, right after the close of London 1908. Also, a part of me has to wonder if they were still a little bit upset about Sweden's flag not being on display at the White City Stadium for the opening ceremony. And if they use that for leverage and they were like, hey, you, the rest of you, you kind of owe us one right now. Uh, but whatever the case, the IOC had a meeting on May 28th, 1909 in Berlin, and these two fellows announced to the other members that Stockholm wanted to throw its hat in the ring for 1912. Now, Cooper Tan also spoke up at this meeting. That should come as no surprise to anyone, uh, because he really wanted to avoid the issue that happened with Italy and the need to relocate the games to London. So we're not going to rehash that whole thing right now. You can go listen to the London 1908 episode if you haven't already and get the scoop on why the games had to move. But basically, Cooperton wanted ironclad assurance that the games would stay in Sweden if they committed to it no matter what. And really, that came down to the finances, right? Just making sure they would actually have the money for the games. Uh, he also expressed a desire that, quote, the games must be kept more purely athletic. They must be more dignified, more discreet, more in accordance with classic and artistic requirements, more intimate, and above all, <laughs> less expensive <laughs> what a dream what a dream <laughs> yeah so anyway balk and von rosen agreed with him on this and they said yes uh they gave him confirmation that we have both the, the finances to host the games and we have the support of king gustav the fifth so with that with those two things settled, the IOC quickly named Stockholm as the host city without opening the discussion up for any other bids. One last thing for them to have to worry about, you know, just check it off. People are busy. Just move on with your life. So Balk was made president of the organizing committee and Crown Prince Gustav Adolf was named as the honorary president because, you know, royalty perks and all of that. Yeah, of course. Furthermore, the Swedish public appear to be very much in support of the games coming to Stockholm. So that's always a plus when people are actually excited about the games coming to your city. It helps. On yeah. <laughs> on <laughs> November 18th, 1910, invitations to attend the games were issued to 27 National Olympic committees, and later on, 15 other nations were invited once the Swedish organizers figured out which athletic associations to contact in those nations. Some unique perks and plans for these games included the fact that the Swedes were going to offer free transport for athletic equipment, which people don't think about how expensive that part of the games is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, even now people talk about it. There's a lot of information out there. It's really fascinating. And right. 
<laughs> intimidating. Um, <laughs> they also offered a 50% discount on the state run railway for competitors and delegates to reduce their daily transportation costs. And they also designated a daily newspaper that would only cover the Olympics in both English and Swedish. In the end, there were 28 nations that attended with a total of 2,407 athletes, including 48 women in the mix and a total of 102 medal events. And as we mentioned before, Japan made its first appearance, also marking the first appearance of an Asian nation. Although, technically speaking, Turkey is part of Asia and had previously participated, but whatever. I don't know. People seem to not count Turkey as part of Asia because I guess it's Europe adjacent, but I, I don't know. Maybe a better way is to say it's the first East Asian country. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I think is geographically more accurate. But yeah. uh, but anyway, it's something that stuck out to me when I kept reading that in multiple sources. I was like, but wait a second. Turkey is technically in Asia and we've seen them at the games before. But whatever. Maybe I'm getting yeah. hung up on something not worth getting hung up on. But, you know, one thing I liked about some of the things you listed off here, some of these perks of the games is is it really seems like the Swedish committee was going out of their way to really think about mm -hmm. how can we make this an easier experience for everybody? How can we make this a more enjoyable experience for everybody? And that's yeah. not really something we've seen happen a whole lot yet with the planning of the games, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it, it wasn't just that people in Sweden were excited to have the Olympics. They they were like thinking, what can we do to make other people excited to come here for the Olympics to compete? Right. So I think that's amazing. So just like every games that we've discussed, we always see, you know, new events coming in, some events getting cut, things of that nature. So what new events did we see here in Stockholm for the first time? Well, originally, the Swedish delegation wanted a simplified Olympic schedule that consisted of only pure athletics, swimming, gymnastics, and wrestling. But other countries really wanted more events, so the program was expanded at the 1911 IOC meeting, which, side note, if those delegates could see what we had in the Olympics today <laughs> or what's to come, oh my, <laughs> they yeah. would have thoughts. <laughs> um, I digress. <laughs> Women's diving made its first official appearance as a medal event, so that's exciting. And women's swimming also made its first appearance as a medal event with two events. We saw the addition of the decathlon and pentathlon, which were both won by Jim Thorpe, and we'll talk more about that later. But the pentathlon in particular was an idea straight from the brain of Pierre de Coubertin. We just we'll always keep talking about him. Oh, yeah. Equestrianism kind of made its debut. <laughs> While horse riding had been included in Paris 1900, this was the first time it included dressage, eventing, and show jumping. Foil competition was added to the fencing program after it had been a demonstration sport in 1908. At Stockholm, Italians Nato Nadi and Pietro Speciale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> would take gold and silver in this new event. So props to Italy. Nadi was only 18 years old when he won. And we'll be bringing him back up when we get to Antwerp, 1920. Mm -hmm. While road racing was not a new event, it's worth mentioning the rather unique fact that in Stockholm, the road race was 199 miles, 320 kilometers. The longest race of any kind in Olympic history. And it was won by South African Rudolph Lewis. For comparison, a cyclist in the Tour de France will ride about 100 miles or less each day. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, that's a really long that's race. That's a really <laughs> long race to do in one day. Because, because yes, the Tour de France is longer in total, but it's done over the course of 20-something days. So they divide it, you know, a little bit of it up each day. So to think of, hey... 200 miles basically in one day is absolutely crazy. I wonder what time they had to start that race. Uh, my legs hurt just thinking about that. <laughs> I know. I know, right? So 
those are kind of the new things or, you know, some new ish things that we saw happening in Stockholm. But I think it's also worth mentioning some events that did not make the cut mm. in Sweden. Yeah, because there's a couple interesting things here. So first off, boxing was cut from the program because Swedish people found it unsavory. And and actually, in some sources I looked at, it, it actually seems like it may have actually been against the law. So, yeah, boxing was knocked out of the Olympic program. <laughs> Great use of words. And figure skating was cut. So we talked about figure skating being added in 1908, but all of a sudden in 1912, they decided to cut it. And the reason they did that was because the organizers didn't want there to be a conflict with something called the Nordic Games that was happening the following year. So the Nordic Games were an event that were held from 1901 to 1926. So they haven't been around for a long time, but they were specifically devoted to winter games. And Sweden always hosted them, at least from what I saw. And get this, one of the founders of the Nordic Games was our guy, Victor Balk of the IOC and the head organizer for these games. So, so yeah, so he decided really that he didn't want figure skating to be at the Olympics so it wouldn't conflict with the other event that he was planning for the next year. But what's also interesting is that a lot of people now seem to look at the Nordic Games as kind of a bit of a precursor to the separate Winter Olympics. So I thought that was really interesting. And once I knew a bit more about the story, it, it made sense why the, they decided to cut it from the program. But uh, but yeah, we yeah. have Victor to blame for that technically. So anyway, it's worth noting that Germany had requested the organizers to add in two new cycling events. One that was called Cycle Polo, which... I'm assuming is polo played on a bicycle instead of horses. I will fully admit I did not do more research on that simply because I kind of like the mystery of it. <laughs> so <laughs> if if I'm wrong about that, so be it. And then the other event that Germany requested <laughs> for them to add was figure cycling. Hmm. I guess since figure skating wasn't going to be there, they said, fine, let's have figure cycling. And again, I did not go deeper on this, but... I'm kind of assuming it's like figure skating, but on bicycles. Anyway, both requests were rejected by the organizing committee. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah, if they, so, took, if they took out a classic event like boxing, I, I don't see yeah. how things could get there. I mean, I know that they were yeah. probably not illegal, but still. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> and, and I had never heard of these sports, so I don't know if they still take place or they still happen. But apparently it was something that Germans really liked at the time. <laughs> so there you go. That's kind of all the background information for these games. But let's actually let's actually get to the Olympics now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So where were things held? Sarah, tell us more about that. There were 12 total venues for the games, including the first time more than one venue was used for the football tournament. The Stockholm Olympic Stadium was built for the games on the site of the old Stockholm Athletic Grounds and was originally planned to be made entirely of stone. But the costs were prohibitive of this even after they held a national lottery to help raise additional funds. I mean, the front of this stadium looks like a freaking castle. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a pretty beautiful building, mm -hmm. and it's definitely worth looking at some pictures if you've never seen it. Um, but yeah, if the Olympics ever go back to Sweden, you know, they should just make the main stadium out of IKEA products, right? Since we've already brought it up, um, you know, maybe they could even just use an actual IKEA store as the obstacle course that they're adding in Pentathlon. <laughs> That's exactly how I feel when I go to IKEA anyway. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, good practice. Yeah. Yeah, you're just kind of lunging over, you know, a bed that suddenly shows up in your path and you have to weave in and out of uh -huh. things and try try not to buy all of the things. So Indeed. but anyway, back to the stadium. So while it's actually one of the smaller Olympic stadiums, uh, Stockholm has worked to actually preserve it and keep it in as much of the original condition as, as possible. Obviously, it's had to have some updates over the years because, you know, it's 
over 100 years old, but they have tried to make it retain the feel that it had in 1912. And it's actually still in use today. They host programs there to encourage healthy living and exercise among youth. Uh, I'm actually going to link a video um, that I found on YouTube. Uh, I'll have that link in the show notes so that you can actually go learn a little bit more about that. But I think that's really cool that it's still very much in active use today. So pretty sweet. Absolutely. Anything that the Olympics leaves a legacy behind of promoting healthy living, I'm always such a fan of that. Yeah. Even though the events had started back on May 5th with the tennis tournament, the official opening ceremony was held on July 6th. So that's a pretty big gap. (laughs) Which, I mean, now we're used to some prelim games and sports taking place like a day or two before opening ceremony. Right. But not not two months. Not two months before. (laughs) But whatever. (laughs) Yeah. The ceremony featured a parade of Swedish women's gymnasts, and the nations entered in alphabetical order by the Swedish alphabet, with Sweden entering last, kind of like today. But unlike what we're used to today, Greece did not enter first. The Swedes were like, alphabetical order only. But to be fair, the tradition of Greece marching in first did not start until later. So it's not like they were actually being jerks about it. They were just organized. Yeah, totally makes sense. But, you know, I don't remember in any of the research for previous games whether they had a specific order, if they did it alphabetical or not. This was the first time that I actually saw that specifically mentioned. So I thought that was kind of cool. That is cool. So the games were opened by King Gustav V, which is fitting since... It was the fifth Olympiad as well. So there you go. And in his opening address, he said, It is with legitimate joy and pride that we Swedes see athletes from every part of the world gathered here with us. It is a great honor for Sweden that Stockholm has been chosen as the scene of the fifth Olympiad. And I bid all of you athletes and friends of athletics a most hearty welcome to this friendly contest of the nations. May the grand thought that found expression in the Olympic Games and classic times be so held in honor by our age, too, that these competitions may become a powerful means to promote the physical health and development of every people. With these words, I herewith declare the Olympic Games of Stockholm opened. I like that he said legitimate joy. That's that's mm-hmm. important. Like, hey, hey, we, we really feel this over here. Um, and other than that, there was no flag drama to report. Way to go, Sweden. All right, so before we get into some of the other events, let's highlight some of the accomplishments of the 48 women who competed at these games by focusing on the two new events that women could compete in, diving and swimming. So really exciting to see more women come. I mean, it's no secret that we've been waiting for this. (laughs) Right. So first off, Sweden got to enjoy a homegrown podium sweep in women's diving, where 17-year-old Greta Johansson won gold. She emigrated to the U.S. the next year, where she ended up marrying Ernst Branston, a fellow Swedish diver who had competed there in Stockholm and had also moved to the U.S., Both have been inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame, Ernst as a coach, and Greta as a diver. Here we go again with athletes marrying up. I know. (laughs) Yeah. Pretty Uh, cool. Yeah. (laughs) In the swimming events for women, the 100-meter freestyle was won by Australian Sarah Fanny Dirac, who made a real splash by also setting a world record. I know, I know. Shocking that an Australian would win a swimming event. I mean, she just started that legacy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we'll never see that happen again, of course. You know, Australia doing so well in swimming, but uh, yeah. but there you go. <laughs> um, fun fact about Fanny: during World War One, a statue of the Virgin Mary and infant Jesus on the top of a cathedral in France was hit by a mortar shell and was knocked to an almost horizontal position. Australian troops serving in France saw it and nicknamed it Fanny in her honor because it reminded them of her diving off the blocks. So, I mean, if you're going to get a if you're going to get a statue with being nicknamed after you, it might as well be Mary and Jesus. Yeah. Well, I mean, it says a lot for the fact that 
in this in that time that Australian soldiers would know who a female athlete was. I think right. that's really what sticks out about it. Like, I don't think that would have been very common. So the fact yeah. that she was well known enough that they would see that and be like, oh, hey, that looks a lot like Fanny jumping mm -hmm. off the blocks for for a race. That's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, and it's also the age before social media. So it's yeah. not like they would see her image necessarily everywhere every day. But she right. was obviously notable enough to in newspapers and mm -hmm. whatnot but yeah i'm with you i think it's pretty cool and like i said if you're gonna have yeah. a statue named after you it might as well be people <laughs> from the bible <laughs> um but that's not the only thing named in her honor an aquatic center in sydney is named after her and also sarah durack avenue located at sydney olympic park so she is clearly a legend yeah fellow aussie Mina Wiley came in second. The two became a bit of a sensation after the games, invited to compete across Europe and even the USA. From 1912 to 1918, Dirac broke 12 world records. She was planning to go to the Antwerp Games in 1920, but got appendicitis and was unable to attend. In 1921, she started coaching and continued to be an influence in women's swimming, until she passed away in 1956. She was inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame in 1967, 11 years after her death. The only other women's swimming event was the 400 meter relay, which was won by Team GB. Also, British women continued their Olympic tennis legacy as Edith Merritt Hannum of Great Britain won two golds in indoor tennis in both doubles and singles. Team GB did not send any athletes for outdoor tennis for Stockholm 1912 because the date of the Olympic tennis tournament overlapped with Wimbledon. So priorities, which I'm also like, who planned yeah. that? <laughs> this, well, the Swedes did. <laughs> so, hey, well, you know, Wimbledon was such a huge British thing that you can't necessarily expect that they would have thought right. of that. And I mean, you can't schedule around everything. You know, so I know, I know. Yeah, it's something it, that would never happen today. Yeah, well, I mean, at least I say that. I don't know, but yeah, you would hope it wouldn't happen today. But you know, it is what it is. At least they were still bringing home medals in tennis, even if it was you know yeah. indoor tennis, still tennis at the end of the day. <laughs> so yeah, let's go ahead and kind of shift gears a little bit to wrestling because there's a really I had never heard this story, and I thought it was really pretty crazy. So in Greco-Roman wrestling, the middleweight semifinal match, so not even the final, the semifinal, it was held between Estonian Martin Klein, who was there representing Russia, and Finland's Alfred Asikanen. The match lasted for 11 hours and 40 minutes. It's the longest recorded wrestling match in modern history, as you can imagine. Now, Klein ended up winning the semifinal, but he was so exhausted from the match, gee, I wonder why, that he was unable to wrestle in the gold medal match against Swedish wrestler Klaus Johansson. So, you know... Klein ended up taking silver by default since he couldn't do the gold medal match. It's and so sad. It is so sad. And I mean, obviously, this is why it's important for us to have time limits now. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, what a bummer to, oh uh, gosh, yeah, to just struggle for so long, like nearly 12 hours so you can win a match so that you can go to the gold medal round, but then you're just too exhausted. There's no way you can even do it. Yeah. That's longer Ugh. than a normal work day. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah, let's also talk a little bit about football. Cause like we mentioned before, this was the first time that the games used multiple venues for the football tournament. Uh, there were 13 teams in total that participated and only FIFA affiliated teams could participate because hashtag FIFA. That's kind of how things work with them. 
Mm-hmm. And in the end, Great Britain faced Denmark in the gold medal match in front of a stadium filled with 25,000 people, and Team GB won 4-2. to two. Now, this is the first of Team GB's three gold medals in Olympic football, which actually makes them tied with Hungary for the most Olympic gold medals won by a country for football. Hmm. It's good for them. Well, I mean, you know how those British people are. They do love themselves some football, so (laughs) it makes sense. (laughs) Moving on to shooting, uh, the most successful athlete of the Stockholm Games was Swedish Army officer and shooter Wilhelm Karlberg with three golds and two silvers. In total, Wilhelm won seven Olympic medals, including a silver in London 1908 and then another silver in Paris 1924, but he really hit his stride here in his home country. Four of his five medals in Stockholm were for team shooting events, but he did also win an individual gold in the 25-meter small bore rifle event. Pretty impressive. That's a that's a good <laughs> haul for, for yeah. one Olympic game. So, so. Yeah, for sure. And, um, Thinking about those years, he had a very long career. Good for him. Yeah, seriously, though. All right, moving on to athletics, because we have a lot of things happening here, uh, which, of course, we do. There's so many different (laughs) events in athletics. So track and field was revolutionized here with the introduction of a fully automatic timing system where the clock would be started by the firing of the start gun and then stopped by a judge at the finish line. Obviously, this was part of the efforts to reduce disagreement about close finishes, kind of like we mentioned earlier. And before the Stockholm Games, the rules had been standardized to avoid some of the issues that we saw back in London 1908. Plus, there was a fact that these were the first games with a mix of officials from different countries to reduce bias in the officiating. So... You know, all positive changes, I think, for mm-hmm. for athletics. Um, but still, just like any time you try new things, there were some issues with the starting and timing system. In particular, the 100 meter race was problematic, which, you know, to this day, the 100 meter dash is one of the highlights of the athletic competition. But here in Stockholm, they had seven false starts. I'll say that again. Seven <laughs> false starts yeah, before fine. That's so many false starts. Yeah. Uh, before finally, Ralph Craig of the U.S. ended up winning gold. You know what they say. Eighth time's a charm, right? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Also from the U.S., Harry Babcock won gold in pole vault, setting a world record of 3.95 meters. And he'd only taken up the sport in 1910 after doing long jump. Clearly, the guy had some natural talent. (laughs) Yeah. Most incredibly, records were set in almost every athletic event, to the point that it's actually easier for us to mention the ones that did not have a record set. So here are the events where a record was not set. The men's 200 meter, the 10 kilometer walk, standing high jump, standing broad jump, triple jump, and hurdles. Every other final saw the gold medalist also set a new world record, which is really cool. Yeah, I can't imagine seeing that happen today, (laughs) but still pretty amazing. Yeah, people would be asking a lot of questions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but we do need to quickly highlight Finnish athlete Hannes Koleminen, who won three golds and one silver at these games. So he won gold in the 10 kilometer, the five kilometer and in the cross country individual race and silver in the cross country team event. Uh, He won the cross-country race by over 30 seconds. So in general, I guess you could say he was good at crossing finish lines. Get it? (laughs) See what I did there? Proud of you. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So speaking of cross-country, this was cool to me because I used to run cross-country. I love that sport a lot. 
uh, but it's only been a part of the Olympics in 1912, 1920, and 1924. So the way that they scored the team event was that the top three runners from each nation were scored uh, instead of them having a separate event for the team. But that's very normal in cross-country competition, so no shocker there. And... You know, I know there's been some rumblings about bringing cross country back into the Olympics. My fingers are kind of crossed for that. I would love to see it (laughs) back in the Olympic Games. It really is a very different discipline in a lot of ways from other athletic events. Well, we owe our listeners an apology and a reminder that we're not experts and sometimes get things wrong. In yeah. our 1908 <laughs> episode, we said that it was the last time tug of war was featured, but that was not true. It turns out it was held at Stockholm 1912. Part of the confusion is that so many teams withdrew from tug of war that it ended up only consisting of one match between Sweden and Great Britain with Sweden winning. Like in 1908, the winning Swedish team was made up of members of the Stockholm police and the silver GB team was the same police team that had won gold in London 1908. So there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, apologies for that. Some of that was just my shoddy research. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, there were, good. Yeah, there were multiple sources I found that said it, that London 1908 was the last time. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing other sources say 1912. But, yeah, digging into it, this is the confusion. Is you only had two teams compete in it. So it wasn't really much of a uh, tournament, right? But anyway, let's talk about modern pentathlon and really we we kind of have to because um you know we're gonna do our best to avoid current uh event (laughs) pentathlon trauma by just sticking to some facts here um (laughs) good news (laughs) yeah as we mentioned earlier the the event was invented by pierre de coubertin uh though and we mentioned this in our 1906 episode, a Greek version of pentathlon did feature at those 1906 games. But remember, Cooperton had not really been a big personal fan of the intercalated games idea. So he had decided to kind of take that and make his own version and tweak it a little bit uh, rather than just use the one that the Greeks had invented for their games. Uh, The event was held across five days, one event a day from July 7th through July 12th. Only men participated, but a 16 year old named Helen Preece, an accomplished British equestrian, actually enrolled to compete until she was denied entry. And uh, according to the Wikipedia article about this, the response to her request by the IOC was, quote, hostile, (laughs) which no big surprises there, (laughs) especially given the fact that this event was Cooperton's baby and we know how he felt about women Mm. participating in the Olympic Games. Yeah, this guy. But still, but still, props to 16-year-old Helen Preece for trying to get in there for pentathlon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Props to her. Another notable participant... George S. Patton, yes, the World War II general who used his own Colt revolver in the shooting portion. (laughs) He ended up placing fifth overall with four Swedes in front of him. So shout out to the guy that I share his last name by marriage. Um, (laughs) That allegedly there's some family relation there, but... okay. um, No offense to extended family that is listening to this. I have yet to see proof. So, (laughs) but (laughs) allegedly there is a relation there. So I don't know. I'll claim it. I'll claim that there's an Olympian in my family from 1912. Sure. You can (laughs) dig around on Ancestry.com later on and see if you can figure that out. So, (laughs) but, uh, but yeah, George Patton, which uh, again, that, that part of his life kind of gets forgotten about because he became (laughs) <laughs> a lot more notable for other reasons. So, yeah, um, but yeah, it's one of my, I'd like, I would say it all the time. It's one of my favorite trivia questions is mm-hmm. asking people if they knew that he was an Olympian. So yeah, now, you know, so, so here's, what's crazy is the pentathlon in 1912 actually did not have equestrianism in it. 
Hmm. Yeah, here's what's confusing, because Helen Priest, who we just talked about, like, she was an equestrian, and she was trying to j jump in there. But if you look at the actual results for the 1912 games, the five events that are listed are long jump, javelin throw, 200 meter race, discus throw, and 1500 meters. Equestrianism is nowhere on this list. <laughs> huh. Okay. So, yeah, so that's a little confusing, and we might have to dig into that a little bit later to see, okay, if, if equestrianism was not a part of it in 1912, why in the world was Helen even trying to get into it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, kind of crazy to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> that it was those that five events, not the five that we've seen for a long time. All right. Now, the winner of the pentathlon was Jim Thorpe, a member of the Sac and Fox Nation who was from Oklahoma, and he became the first American of Native ancestry to win a gold medal. He won both the decathlon and the pentathlon by huge margins. In fact, he won the decathlon by over 600, or sorry, by 688 points. And to give you an idea of how big of a gap that is, the point difference between the next two competitors was about 310 points. So uh, we are going to dedicate our next episode and the last official episode of the season to his story because there's just too much but. Thorpe was an incredibly multi-talented athlete competing in American football and baseball, even outside of his track and field accomplishments. So as a bit of a teaser for his episode, he was stripped of his medals that he won at the 1912 games uh, in 1913. But these were then reinstated to him by the IOC in 1983, 30 years after his death. We'll get to all of that and we'll explain how all of that went down. But if you go and look this up afterwards, this is why you'll see two gold medalists listed for pentathlon and decathlon for 1912. Even though if you look at the results and the standings, you'll see that that's not because of a tie. You know who else competed in both the pentathlon and decathlon? Future IOC president Avery Brundage. Remember mm -hmm. that name. <laughs> oh, yeah. We've already mentioned him a few times <laughs> yeah. in the past. Yeah. But um, and I, I think I always say something about remembering his name. He's just <laughs> showing up. <laughs> yep. After four events, he was actually tied for third, but then he didn't finish the final event. The 1500 meter landing him in fifth in the pentathlon and he fared worse in the decathlon in 16th and did not finish in the decathlon. So... Sorry, Avery. Hmm. You know, I mean, tied for third after four events is not awful. And but uh, no, yeah, I, I didn't dig deeper into why he wasn't able to finish the 1500 meter if he got injured or pulled something and had to drop out. That I feel like is probably the most likely reason. But I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't go down that rabbit trail because I don't really care that much if he did pull something and had to drop out but. yeah exactly for most people it'd be like oh that's sad they didn't finish and we're over yeah. here like eh, yeah okay. we, don't, we don't feel that bad for him so anyway um okay let's talk about the marathon we got to talk about the marathon. <laughs> we got to talk about the marathon um, because, yeah, we have we have some things happening here like we usually do. Um, <laughs> now we'll get the sad part. Uh, we'll talk about it first and get it out of the way. OK, uh, so the day of the race, July 14th, was a particularly hot day because somehow the weather just always seems to know when it's marathon day. I don't know what it is, but it seems to kind of be a trend. Now, Portuguese athlete Francisco Lazaro actually died of heat exhaustion during the race. This is the only Olympic marathon where an athlete has actually died. Knock on wood. We want to hopefully keep that <laughs> to be the case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's just a reminder of how dangerous the race can actually be and the importance mm -hmm. of having water and medical stations throughout the route. So, yeah, you know what? 
just just a quick little safety note for any listeners that are training for a marathon, especially if you've never done one before. When you start doing some of those longer distances in your training, you, you need to have some kind of safety plan in place. So for me, I designed my long routes when I was training so that I had to pass by my house a couple times. Uh, that way I could use it as a water station. I wore a running belt with water bottles on it. Um, I always carried either a little bit of cash or my debit card on me. So if I needed to stop somewhere and buy water or food, I could do that. Now, I was doing that before Uber was you know, popular, but that's another thing now is, yeah, you know, make sure that you have some way to get a ride if you if something happens to you. Right. And, and I don't probably don't need to tell people this, but you know, I kept my phone on me. People are going to be doing that mm-hmm. now anyways. Uh, but yeah, I did but make that. make sure it's charged. <laughs> yes, make sure it is charged. Um, now, obviously, I was doing that because I needed to track the distance. But also, yeah, if I needed to call for help and needed to call my wife to come rescue me from somewhere, then I could do that. So and, and I always planned my long runs at a time that I knew that my wife would be able to do that and that she wouldn't yes. be busy with something else. So, you know, if you're a single person, then, you know, at least find, a, you know, a friend who can be available mm-hmm. when you go on your long runs, who can help you out if need be. But safety first, just always remember. I used to have a roommate and I would tell her before I'd go on a long run. And mm-hmm. she like, even if she was at work, she was in a position where it was like, if there was an emergency, she could leave, take care yeah. of me. <laughs> but um, yeah, or like I would have friends that would put water like in their mailbox if if I knew I was going to run by their house I'd be like hey can you just like leave something in your mailbox um but yeah I would do the same thing take money do whatever (laughs) whatever you got to do did the water ever go missing because the mailman thought like oh this person's so nice leaving me a bottle of water on a hot day (laughs) (laughs) no not that I know of but whenever I did marathon running It was when I was working at Starbucks, so I would work in the mornings. Mm. Um, And so my long runs would be in the afternoon, so probably didn't have to battle the mailman too much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or postal worker, I could say. We we have male women, too, you know, so yeah, postal worker. Anyway, my bad. Um, Anyway, we could talk about marathon stuff all day. (laughs) Yeah. So, okay. so after that sad bit, uh, we need a little bit of a laugh. So we mentioned Japan participating earlier, and to this day, the Japanese people have a special love for the marathon. So if you watched the games in Tokyo, this was something that got mentioned even during the marathon races is how big of a deal the marathon is in Japan. Now, in Stockholm, a Japanese marathon runner named Kanakuri Shiso participated but he went missing during the race. At least that's what officials thought when he never crossed the finish line. What really happened is that he got heat stroke and he passed out. I know you're saying, where's the laugh in this? This all sounds really sad and serious. Okay, so a farming family did find him, thank goodness. They took him to a party that was happening at a villa uh, just off of the race route so that they could give him water, take care of him. And since he knew then that, you know, the race was kind of shot for him at that point, he decided to catch a train back to Stockholm. And then he just left the country the next day to go back to Japan. So since he did not notify the race officials about dropping out of the race, they didn't mark him down as DNF or did not finish for those who don't know that acronym. They listed him as missing and they actually sent search parties (laughs) looking for the guy. And it was only later on that Swedish officials found out what had actually happened and that he was safe and sound at home in Japan. So 50 years later, he was invited back to Stockholm so that he could finish the race. So Kanakuri Shizo, (laughs) the Japanese marathoner, has an unofficial time of 54 years, 8 months, 6 days, 8 hours, 32 minutes, and 20.3 seconds for the marathon. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you know who Molly Seidel is, she is mm-hmm. our American woman who got a bronze in Tokyo um, last summer for the Tokyo 2020 Games. 
Uh, but she had this kind of viral video, probably viral to the sports community, <laughs> where during COVID lockdowns, she tried to do like the slowest mile. <laughs> and she she was running like a very slow speed. And I think her mile time was like 37 minutes or something. Um, but it was impressive. But I'm just thinking like, Molly, you can try, but you are never going to pass his record no. for the longest marathon time. <laughs> and good luck to anyone that thinks that they can do that. Yeah. I, I just think it's funny that Sweden invited him back to do that. Yeah. And they were like, hey, like you, you could still finish the race if you want to, you know, like since you didn't, ever officially drop out of the race you might as well finish right so i'm really feeling like we need more olympic games in sweden i i feel like that too actually <laughs> we were so, so yeah if there's any people in sweden out there if there's an especially if you've got some authority like come on like throw your hat in the ring 2004 actually they were one of the bids for the games that ended up going to athens i don't know how many other times they put in a bid but Come on, IOC. Let's let's get yeah. the games back in Sweden See, again. <laughs> like we need to finish talking about the marathon, but it's like we started this yeah. episode being like, oh, we don't know much about Sweden. And now <laughs> the next time people see us, we're going to be decked out in blue and yellow and <laughs> <laughs> little Swedish nerds that yeah. just think it's the best place ever. So anyway, yeah. back to the marathon. Who actually won the race? Yes. Well, Irishman Kennedy MacArthur won the gold. He was born in Durbach, Northern Ireland, but he moved to South Africa when he was 20. And so he actually represented South Africa at the 1912 Games. He didn't have an interest in athletics until he joined the Johannesburg Police Force in 1906 and won multiple championships, including two national championships for cross country. He ran his first marathon ever in late 1908, and in an upset, he beat the 1908 Olympic silver medalist, Charles Hepburn of South Africa. During the 1912 marathon, he and teammate Christian Gitchum ran together as part of their strategy for the race. Apparently, they had agreed beforehand that if one of them needed to stop for a break, then they would do it together so they could keep each other's pace. But when Gitchum decided <laughs> to stop for later or stop for water late in the race, Ken just kept on running, taking the lead <laughs> and beating his countrymen by 58 seconds with a final time of two hours, 36 minutes and 54 seconds. The next year, he sustained a foot injury that forced him into retirement from athletics. So maybe that was a little bit of karma. But get this. <laughs> of the six total marathons he ran, he won all of them. Pretty impressive. That's, but, that's really impressive. Yeah. But if I'm his teammate, I mean, <laughs> I'm irritated. Well, but someone, I mean, one of them had to win at the end of the day. It's like, what was their game plan for the very end of the race? Like, at, yeah, at a certain like, point... <laughs> but instead of instead of waiting for the water break to to just ditch yeah. him, like get through the water stops and and then like just do a full on sprint to see who can win. I don't know. Yeah, and, and maybe that was their original plan, but for whatever reason, he was like, "Look, dude, I'm not stopping right now. I'm gonna keep going." And and he won. It made the difference. So, um, but yeah, once again, we've got a, we've got an Irish guy doing, mm -hmm. you know, really well <laughs> here. So, but yeah, I I've seen some sources call him the man who didn't stop. And at first I thought that was a, like a good nickname, like, Oh, he, he never stopped running mm -hmm. the marathon. Like, yeah, sure. that's, but this is why they call him that. Cause he didn't stop <laughs> for his teammate. Like, they had agreed to. We need to chat a little bit about the legacy of these games before we move on. Yeah, and we always love talking about the medal tables. So mm -hmm. with the medal table, here we go. Sweden had 65 total medals, 24 were gold. So good job, Sweden. Way to show up. The yep. U.S. had 64 total with 26 gold. Great Britain won 41 total medals, 10 of which were gold. Finland came in with 26 medals, 9 were gold. 
and Germany had 26 total, six were gold. Yeah, and I know some people might be upset I put the U.S. second since the U.S. had more gold. You know, we've kind of <laughs> talked about that debate before, but uh, debate. yeah, but but this time around, I was like, you know what, we're going with total. We're going to let Sweden have their moment as the host country, right? I'm telling you we're Sweden fans. So, <laughs> yeah. USA who? <laughs> yeah, there's that that host country magic, you know, of doing really well. So, but if you haven't figured it out already, the legacy of the Stockholm Games as a whole was that they were really well organized and they went really well with relatively few problems. No one's perfect, but these were pretty dang close overall. Uh, the fifth Olympiad truly announced that the Olympic Games had finally hit their stride and that they were here to stay. That Coubertin's experiment was both viable and valuable on an international level. So on July 4th, 1912, so just a couple days before the opening ceremony, the IOC held their annual Congress so that they could start considering the bids from six potential host cities for the 1916 Games. And they ended up selecting Berlin. But when Franz Ferdinand, not the band, but the Archduke of Austria was assassinated on June 28, 1914. A political and military ripple effect triggered what would become known as World War I, consuming all of Europe in the deadliest and most destructive war known to history at that time. This meant the canceling of the Sixth Olympiad and an eight-year wait for the next Olympic Games. That, I mean, that's pretty wild. Like, it, yeah. it almost feels like a foreshadowing of what's to come. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. I'm sure that, you know, there is some tension already building at that point in history. Mm. Like, we know this, but it's pretty wild. And I don't know, I think it's more of a coincidence or anything, but um, thinking right. ahead to future Olympic Games and host cities and where Olympics were going to take place like mm -hmm. on the brink of world war ii right it's just right. it's pretty it's pretty wild to think about yeah i mean again it's one of those things where truth is stranger than fiction right yeah like it yeah. like if you were writing this in a book just people would be like oh that's too much of a stretch that you know one of the countries that's central to world war one would have been the host city and it has to be canceled <laughs> on their mm -hmm. watch but I mean, that is what really happened. And Berlin made sense as a host city because sure. Germany loves the Olympic Games. At this point, they had been involved in every single Olympiad in some, you know, shape or form and and had done relatively well. Right. So, you know, from the sound of it, they were really eager to have the games there, which is part of why they won the bid. But, yeah, you know, it's also there's some interesting tension here where you see the Olympic Games again finally hitting their stride and really mm -hmm. making an impact on the international community, bringing some international cooperation and some peace. And then that completely gets torn apart by World War One. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, are we back to square one now? Like, like, what was the point of doing this? <laughs> if if this can happen to the world and you know i have to wonder what was going through the minds of the ioc at that time you know was there that worry that is this going to destroy the olympic games as well can we come back mm -hmm. from this um right. so yeah so if you if you ever look at list of olympic games uh, this used to really confuse me of why isn't antwerp 1920 considered the, the sixth Olympiad, right? Uh, but it's because even these canceled games, they're still considered the sixth Olympiad, even though they didn't happen. Uh, that marker is kind of left there as a reminder of what was supposed to happen. And then Antwerp 1920 is the seventh Olympiad. So probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but it is worth talking about that here. We suddenly have this break in the games and we're going to miss them you know, for uh, for a whole Olympic cycle. Yeah. So in the same way that the world had to wait for the next Olympic Games, Stockholm 1912 is the last Olympiad that we're going to talk about for this season. 
And when we come back with season two, we will dive into Antwerp 1920. And I'm going to put a direct link to our the show's email in the show notes. So if you have feedback for us, if you have thoughts, if you have suggestions on maybe things you would like to see in 19 or sorry, 1920 <laughs> things you would like to see in the second season, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're going to start looking at those and generating some ideas while we're taking a little bit of a break. But if you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did. Then come back for our last athlete profile of this season, where, as we already mentioned, we will discuss the life of Jim Thorpe and the story of how he unjustly lost his Olympic medals. But until then, ought to see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content features in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.